Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome. Um, I want you to know that the color coordination you see here was not planned. Okay? <laughs> this was spontaneous. So we're taking this as an omen that um, everything from here on out is fabulous. And um, I'm so glad you could join us tonight. It, 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 there's a really good feeling in this room. Um, and I'm eager to continue chatting with uh, Lisa and Jamia. We've had some incredible conversations to prepare for this night. Um, but before we do, I was hoping we could do some um, meditation just to arrive and ground. And um, that, you guys seem ready. That sounds okay. okay. And um, you can, yeah, feel free to sit in a way that feels comfortable. I usually like to sit with my feet connecting to the ground if I can. Um, been known to kick off my shoes, but I'm going to try to keep them on up here. And uh, you can close your eyes or soften them to the space in front of you if that feels comfortable. And um, hands, uh, actually, I know I started to set you up, but can we pause and come back here in a second? I just want to foreground this meditation just a little bit, if that's okay. Okay. Rewind. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I get the sense because you guys all, you know, got into formation that many of you are meditators in this space. Um, I want to um, just say that uh, the meditation practice we'll do today is is based in a mindfulness um, is a mindfulness practice, right? So it's a practice of knowing what's happening um, in the present moment, paying attention without judgment, um, and that we'll start in a in the way that we often start these kinds of meditations is um, paying attention to the feeling of breathing um, as a way to kind of gather and unify your attention. And if paying attention to your breath doesn't feel calming to you, don't, don't worry about doing that. You can pay attention to the sensation of your hands. You can pay attention to your feet. We're just finding some place in the body, maybe in the body, maybe even sound, if that's a better place to rest your awareness, to just come back to again. So it's this way of, even though You've had a whole day and there's many channels of things going on, you know, thinking, feeling, um, all kinds of perception that we're honing in on one spot uh, in this field of awareness to bring our attention back to as a way to just kind of gather the mind. Um, and we'll do that for a few moments. And then uh, I'm gonna guide a practice that I realized as we started to sit may not be as familiar to some of you in the room um, because somebody uh, made it up <laughs> as a way to um, to train in paying attention to our thoughts in a way that has a little bit more um, lightness and creativity. So um, if you've been meditating ever, um, and certainly for a while, um, you probably noticed that thinking is inevitable, that um, if we think we're going to get rid of thoughts in meditation, um, it's just like a losing battle. Like the mind thinks it's what it does. You know, the ears hear, the nose smells, the mind thinks, and um, it just kind of pumps out thoughts all day. And this meditation is a way to start to, um, to rather than get rid of thoughts, to shift our relationship to thoughts in a way that can feel warm and inviting and that can inspire. Um, so that's, that's the, the idea with today's meditation. So I just wanted to let you know where we're going before I, <laughs> before I guide you. Is that, is that cool? Okay, great. Let's go back. <laughs> so, finding your comfortable meditation seat, uh, closing your eyes or softening to, to the space in front of you, letting the hands relax on the thighs or clasp in the lap or somewhere where they can, can just rest. and taking pleasure, um, if you can, in just sitting, to letting the body be simple as it can, and surrendering your weight of the body to the chair that you're sitting on, to the floor, to the earth that's beneath the floor. Deep pause. And before we do any kind of techniquing, just taking a moment to like, do a little check-in with yourself. How is my mind right now? Lots of little thought bubbles, one big <coughs> thought chunk. Is it smooth? Is it shimmering? 
noticing any emotional tones or moods that are present in the heart. Sometimes I don't even know what I'm feeling until I sit and do this, so it might be something that you know is up, it might be something that's just having the opportunity now to announce itself, and just knowing how, how you are. And not needing to push away anything that's happening in your mind or your heart or your body, but just starting to tune your awareness to feel more intimately perhaps the sensation of your breath coming and going. Noticing the change of temperature in the nostrils and the movement of the chest and the movement of the belly and following that movement, the sensation of that movement with your awareness. So it's as if your, your mind is the dance partner of your breath and it just follows wherever, wherever the breath goes. And from time to time, um, you'll notice thinking arising, but for now, we'll just um, let those thoughts go as best we can and return to the breathing. You might even say to the thought, you know, I'll invite you in in just a second, you know, just two minutes to pay attention to the breath. Noticing where the mind is now, and then one more time, inviting it to come back to the feeling of breathing with the confidence that a, a gathered mind is a powerful mind. And we generate a great deal of power when we collect and unify our awareness in this way. And then I'm going to guide us into the second part of the practice, which is going to be this thought party. And if at any time it feels like too complex or just too much, you can feel free to um, come back to mindfulness of breathing. But if you're willing, I'd like you to imagine that you're sitting in a um, beautiful place of your choice, a place where you like to host a party. It could be the lawn in Central Park. It could be a wooded cabin, a fancy rooftop. Just picturing your ideal party space. And if you can see in your mind's eye the way that the space is decorated, the colors, the size, is it an intimate dinner affair, or is it a, a huge rave? And that at this moment, you at the host are standing or sitting near the entrance of the party, quietly waiting for the first guest to arrive. And 
and the guests that are invited to this party are your thoughts. And so, you know, as the host, you can sit quietly and just pay attention to your breath as you've been doing, sense of the body present. And now when a thought comes up, instead of asking it to go away, you'll notice what the thought is like. So kind of what's the character of the thought? Is it a um, angry thought, silly thought? What tone of voice does it use? How might it dress? Taking a moment to say hello when it arrives. Spending just a few moments with it. And then because you want to be a good host and ready for the other thoughts, just go ahead and usher that, that thought into the party space. And sitting again at the front of the at the front of the space, opening up the mind. Are there any thoughts that want to enter right now? Who's waiting at the door? Visualizing yourself greeting them, getting a sense of who they are, what their story is. and then inviting them inside as well. So trying this on your own for a few minutes, you might find that there's long pauses between guests or sometimes guests all <coughs> arrive all at once. Feel free to introduce your thoughts to one another if you'd like. Party is starting to fill up, so looking around the corner, seeing if there's any last guest that is rushing down the, the way to, to come in. Acknowledging it, thanking it for coming. Spending a little time. Allowing it to come inside. And we'll imagine that we're flash forwarding to the end of the evening and um, that you're watching your guests go by one and one go out one by one, seeing if you can remember who came, watching them leave, thanking them. Take care, see you next time. And having a moment or two to yourself at the, the entrance of the party, having a sense that you hosted these guests well. Feeling the body breathing. 
And then starting to let that visualization dissolve, but bringing to the fore the sense of the body again. Perhaps a couple deep breaths. In a moment, I'll ring the bell, and when I do, feel free to, on your own time, open your eyes, lift your gaze, look around, stretch a bit if you'd like. Cool. So, um, <laughs> we'd love it if you would actually take this opportunity to just um, share you know, one or two things that occurred to you or that you learned maybe in this meditation. It could be that you learned that you were just really tired and you should <laughs> go to sleep early tonight or you know, whatever you want to share is good. Um, you didn't, there's no way you could have done this wrong. So, um, but uh, I'll just ask that you make gr twos or maybe threes and be responsible for looking around and just making sure that there's nobody who's not talking to anybody if they don't want to be, you know, they might say, no, I'm good, but. If someone's alone, you know, invite them in, and we'll just take about um, two, three minutes to share what came up for you, what did you see, what did you notice about, about your mind. Beautiful. Yeah, you're, we'll follow your lead. It's good to have more than enough. We can always do one, like. Right. Feeling good. I have to wake up early tomorrow, so it was nice to like wind down. Exactly. We were listening to this really cool podcast today. It was on um, how to survive the end of the world. Ooh, I love that one. It's a, it's a, it's a. Sometimes it's awesome, sometimes it's a little too much. Um, so many things. But, um, Hashtag everything. <laughs> it was, it's these two writers and theorists that I really love, Adrian Marie Brown and Autumn Brown, and they were talking about, um, they were doing a presentation at Brown University, and they were talking about time. I saw the pictures of that, yes. And they were talking about, um, and, and someone was like, well, how in the future will we disrupt time? You know, how will we alter time? And they said, I'll do it just... How is that for everyone? Before we jumped into conversation, so I'm Lisa. Um, before we jumped into conversation, uh, we wanted to get a little bit of a sense of who was in the room with us tonight. So just like show of hands, um, who here is a writer? Thank you. Who here likes to write? Okay. <laughs> who here? <laughs> Um, who here is a reader? Um, who here is a storyteller? Great. Um, who here has felt like they were really listened to this week? 
That's really good. <laughs> Who here felt that they did some really good listening this week? I love this room. Let's yeah, stay let's here. Be friends forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll ask just like a couple more questions. Um, who here is a caregiver? A caregiver. A uh, teacher. Healing arts professional. Great. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you. I think we have a lot of storytellers and creatives yeah. here. And things to tell stories about. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, thank you for that. And. Um, thank you so much both for being here. This is um, truly exciting to be here in conversation with you. I respect your work so much. And um, as I was thinking about this topic of healing through storytelling and the power of stories, um, I was remembering um, some of my early experiences in meditation, actually, and an instruction that um, I used to hear a lot about meditation, which was um, when big waves of emotion came up, uh, and you go to a teacher and they'd be, like, you'd be like, I'm experiencing so much pain, so much grief, so much anger, so much fear. They'd be like, drop the story and feel the feeling. That was the mm -hmm. instruction. And um, I think it came from an American Buddhist nun named Pema Chodron. Is that right? Mm -hmm. People, I'm like, Buddhist nerds out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it's a good instruction in a way, right? That the, there can be this way of, even in a meditation practice that we start to go into obsessive thinking and rehearsing a narrative that, um, that doesn't serve or isn't true and you can kind of get hooked in it so that it starts to, um, to keep the body on this loop of activation, mm -hmm. right? And there's something about suspending that story and coming into the sensation of the body that can help it start to resolve. Um, and I knew that um, as a woman of color, as a queer person, um, that so much of my identity was taught to me through story and that there was something that really rubbed me about that instruction, drop the story and feel a feeling. I was like, but all the stories? <laughs> drop all, all of the stories? Um, and that I had a real um, need for um, having a new relationship with some stories, but I didn't want to drop them completely. So. Um, so I just wondered if we could start there around the practice of storytelling and you know, curious about what your, your practice of story or of writing is and how, um, how it relates to feelings, how it relates to sense of identity. Um, yeah. Hmm. So thank you for sharing that because I very much identify with that too and I think you know, in a lot of spiritual spaces I've been in as well, I've had a lot of people kind of say, oh, well, that's kind of a story that you need to let go of, or I'm sure everyone's kind of heard this, or that's a story that you can choose to embrace or not. And I do think when you come from communities where your story, your origin story, has either been taken away from you, or repressed, or um, hidden from your ancestors, and you know, there's this could happen through lineage or it could happen through your birth story or those kinds of things that the story is something that is integral to understanding who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and it is limiting to kind of ask someone to um, let go of, if you think of certain other worldviews, their ancestral narrative that leads them to have a greater understanding of themselves. And so for me, the practice of writing is really important because I do feel like the African-American narrative tradition very much informs who I am. And the idea that writing and reading would be such powerful insurgent tools that the overseers and violators who owned my people, um, who they, uh, made sharecrop their land for free for hundreds of years, would bar my ancestors from reading and writing because it was so powerful, right. um, really makes it for me a, a practice of rebellion mm -hmm. 
mm. which is for my spirit very strong. I've always felt like I was born sort of a warrior spirit and of warriors. Mm -hmm. I've just known that about myself uh, since I was like, you're not the boss of me on the playground. <laughs> I can tell and, you that. <laughs> you know, and like people will say that to you, you know, anyone who knows me, my husband, my board, right? That's just been integral to who I've been since day one um, or even before my soul like entered this body. But I think that that spirit of rebellion and the spirit of catharsis. And so when I go to write and wake up early in the morning to write for myself, it's about releasing those stories that don't serve me, which maybe that's what Pema meant. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's also about thinking thank you to my ancestors who fought for my right to be able to tell my story in a way that I can share with the world, disrupt narratives that dehumanize and oppress people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm and to be able to now create books and midwife books for people as a publisher by day and then write my own at night that i have to be connected to this craft um, and that it is a privilege but it's also a way that like breathing like water that i need to stay connected to myself there are things that i can say in the practice of writing that i can't say out loud and I love to talk, <laughs> but it's a different, it's a different kind of experience that the things that come through me and, and I think also uh, for me, the practice of writing is something that uh, I think is one of non-judgment for mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. that I feel that what comes out of me and that comes onto the page is truth as I see it. Mm -hmm. And that, that is something I need to see every day in a society and a media culture that's always kind of gaslighting me into believing that my truth is somehow abject. That me knowing, okay, I wrote this thing that it came out of me, it came from my spirit. Right. It is, is very powerful and it's an affirmation to remind me that I don't need to be validated by external uh, forces. I don't need to be given permission to be. And, and seeing the writing uh, now in the form of books that I see younger people, since I do a lot of books for young readers too, seeing themselves in that writing, uh, feeling less alone has also helped me kind of heal as a result. And so my practice is that of kind of um, witnessing just my being and worthiness through the writing mm, mm. and that of my ancestors. And what's one story that um, you were able to tell in writing that you weren't able to say out loud? Mm, there's so many. The, so one story that I think that comes up to me because there's so much that I write is I have written letters mm. to my younger self, forgiving her mm. for doubting herself, for... Uh, making other people's opinions important over her own worthiness, the shame of feeling like I could let other people tell me who I am is something that's been deep for me because outwardly I am someone who will kind of say, I don't care what you think of me, but to actually write on paper that there's still a part of me that very much does care because I think that's a part of being human is mm. something I've wrestled with over and over. And so I haven't, very frequent practice of writing letters of forgiveness to myself. Um, recently, I participated in this really cool thing called Story File. It's this new app. They're uh, getting people to tell their stories in an archive, and some of us have gotten to be the beta people to be in those stories. Oh my gosh, fun. It's so cool because you know it's gonna live forever. Yeah. <laughs> and then people will then be able to join this app, tell their own stories, and then ask us questions through the app, and then just get answers through the stories to be in conversation with people they may never meet and learn about our lives. Oh, that's so and when I did it, although it wasn't writing, it made me think a lot about writing because it kind of asked me that, that similar sort of question of, you know, what was the hardest thing that you've ever overcome? And just being able to bear witness to them saying, you know, if you had advice for your younger self, I said, oh, you know, I've written, I've written letters to myself, forgiving myself for dating four or five dudes. <laughs> who really weren't worthy of my body mm. or my time. Mm. And owning that there was something in myself <laughs> that, and I said dudes too on it, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, that, that there's dudes. Um, that, but that I can have compassion for them too and the fact that I needed to learn those lessons of, 
understanding why I needed their validation, why I needed to see in them something that I knew about myself was, but was afraid to own in my own power. And there was this moment afterward where I thought, oh gosh, you know, the last time I talked about one of these dudes in the media, I got an email. <laughs> <laughs> From dude? Yeah, from dude. Oh, no. Um, and it was just a, a blank forward, which really cracked me up, too, because I thought, you knew it was true. You could just send me a blank forward to just acknowledge that it's there. Um, that, but a reminder that, oh, yeah, this, this was powerful enough to also remind me that it was still there. So even in releasing the story, there was this quick fear of, like, what would they think that I told my truth about mm. just how... I didn't need to be focused on getting mm. other people's validation. I needed to be learning about me. I needed to be embracing me. I needed to know what joy and pleasure was for myself, not for how somebody else valued me. And, and still, even after releasing it and writing it and sharing it, there was still that t twinge of, oh, what yeah. do they think that I shared my truth, right? Yeah, and yeah. so it was a reminder for me to go home and kind of write about that and to also be reminded mm. of what I think writing gives is such a great gift which is that I, as a writer, don't believe it's a craft that you can ever perfect, mm. which is why I like the people who seek it as a vocation or a practice yeah. or an experience, because I think that when you're on your journey as a writer, and it's, maybe it's like meditation in the same way that you can always expand. Yeah, you know, actually what you said um, reminded me of uh, something that, that happens in meditation practice sometimes with... Um, you know, like a loving kindness practice or what, what you are describing sounds like a truth telling practice, right? Where um, you do the thing and then sometimes it cultivates love, sometimes it cultivates a sense of power and sometimes it, it we call it a purification because it actually draws up everything that's not mm. love or not power. Like you can intend to send love and suddenly kind of feel a lot of fear, right? Yes. And that the way that we can think of that is um, almost as a detox, like it's mm. something that's coming up to be released in this way. Um, so yeah, what a practice. And I felt like that after your meditation, so thank you for uh. that. I felt the, the purification. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> I hope it wasn't too gnarly. Um, <laughs> Lisa, what, what about you? What's, what's your practice? Um, so many things. I first just want to say I'm so happy to be here, and this is such an awesome group, and the quality of listening that's happening is really palpable, mm -hmm. and it's such an honor to be up here with you guys. Um, it's important to me that my practice is playful mm -hmm. and flexible. Mm -hmm. I can become really militaristic mm -hmm. and make and workaholic <laughs> about absolutely everything. <laughs> so it's really important to me to be militaristic about play because that doesn't come natural to me. <laughs> and um, I, I'll talk about my practice in a second because it's so important to me to be really practical. This is, there's a mystical experience and a spiritual experience that can come as a result of all of these things, but we're talking about words and craft and language and listening and storytelling. So there's things that I do mostly on a daily basis. I was really listening, hearing you, Jamia, what I was listening to was how important intention is when it comes to practice and how beautiful it was how you, Kate, stepped back. I mean, for me, that's what my practice at its best is like, is when I start something and say, wait, I'm going to change course. I'm going to give myself permission to change course, mm. either in a project or how I'm working with someone or whatever it is. And that's the moment that's like, I'm actually being truthful. So that's important to me, and I, I learn a lot by um, your example in that. Um, and in terms of practice, pra words like practice and words like writing or storytelling or story start to mean nothing to me when we use them in these, these big ways. For me, it's about why are you telling this and who are you talking to? Mm. What do you need to do it? And what are you trying to say? When I'm working with people and I'm working with myself, those are the four questions I ask. So I think of writing is potentially really powerful medicine. Mm -hmm. I think of it as life-saving, life-changing, life-transforming medicine. And I love this um, parallel between a writing practice and a, I would say just yoga practice, but meditation practice, it really is and can be a spiritual practice. It doesn't have to be, you know, it can be a way of just relaying information, but that's not probably why we're all here tonight. 
and looking at um, something that I wanted to bring to the forefront because I find evidence really compelling. The way that my thinking can go sometimes is, um, you know, I have a, a very common, so I work with writers one-on-one -on -one a lot of the time and I teach classes, but I, I work with writers to help them uh, birth and develop book projects and bring them into the world. And a very common first thing that people say to me or comes out is something along the lines of like, they want to do this thing. They really want to. It's been burning inside them. They're ready to tell this story. Maybe it's the story like they were told they shouldn't tell because of any number of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, usually that spells shame or something like that. And they say, who the hell do, you, do I think I am? Like, who the hell do I think I am to tell this story? Who the hell do I think I am to have the right to do this? And I think one practice that I, you know, I heard so much in that beautiful practice of these love letters to your younger self is, A, you know, the, like, who the hell are you not to? Mm -hmm. Like, how many times are we, we here, right? And maybe many, but maybe this, this, this story gets this one shot. And then another, you know, a practice that I find really useful is, you know, me at my desk or me, whatever I'm, I'm I, wherever I'm, my, you know, desk is where I'm, I'm attempting to write, you know, in, in place of myself putting like my beloved, like my most favorite person. It could be little Lisa, it could be my dog, it could be, you know, my favorite friend. And like, I would never say to that person, like, who the hell do you think you are right. trying to, to do this thing? Um, so I'm thinking about, um, this might be for a later moment, but just intention and outcome for when you're trying to write something. So writing for healing or writing for personal purposes versus writing for an audience might be really separate things, but both really valid mm. and both um, really, really productive and transformative. My personal practice with writing um, has really become a daily activity and it tends, I tend to do some form of yoga. I find I really need to like just shake it up a little bit and a sitting practice and then I write for some period of time and it's often stuff like you described that's just sort of like shaking the wool out. Yeah. And my writing practice when I'm working on something, it's important to me to have some kind of accountability buddy, not just like spirit, but an actual person who's like, how is it going, you know? And I like to be that for other people. And um, I, like, I need to have a changing course with that. It doesn't work for me to be really, really um, militaristic about that. I find that my creative path enjoys like more expansive, quiet, trusting, mm -hmm. sweet environments. Um, Sometimes when I, like, on a deadline, that's kind of different, but I, I try not to um, force that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I love that you brought in this, like, you know, adaptability and willingness to shift, and I feel like, I, I feel like, um, and the body, and I feel like I've learned a lot of that from my body, like, that sometimes I have a plan for what my body's going to do, and my body's like, mm-mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it could be something physical, you know, it could be, re you know, it, it, but um, like learning to respond to what's actually happening as opposed to what I think should be happening in that moment um, and honoring that has been such a, um, yeah, I've, I've learned that through, you know, injury, I've learned that through illness. Um, and, you know, since we're talking about, you know, power and healing, I'm, I'm curious about for the two of you, um, you know, where, the word, the phrase is, I mean, the way the question's coming to me is like, where do you locate your body in your writing? Mm. Like, um, yeah. Mm. I like that. Uh, you know, I would say when I think of things that are room to grow uh, in my life or things that, you know, don't come easily for me, embodiment is one of them. When I think of you know things that uh, feel most comfortable for me, being in the cerebral kind of thinking through, getting involved in rigorous analysis, all those kinds of things I love. And then 
when I'm asked to do a purely physical practice and there are other people there watching, or maybe I think they're watching, but they're not, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it shuts me down. And I think there are a variety of reasons of that for that for me. And I've interrogated that in my writing and for mm. years kind of kept a lot of that private and would write about other things and would write about a lot of social issues and things like that. And then once I went to a spiritual conference that my friend Megan Watterson had held called mm -hmm. Reveal that was really about women kind of coming together and owning our spiritual moral authority and recognizing that in so many spiritual traditions we had had our bodies written out mm -hmm. of, um, of spirit and that those things being disconnected was an act of violence against um, women. And in that she had encouraged me to share the story of being born um, blind in one of my eyes and all of the sort of weird mm -hmm. and ableist experiences I'd had with um, teachers and doctors and other people making me feel object about having this rare condition or somehow discovering it and then changing their relationship to me. And I wrote a piece about it that uh, went viral for a uh, girls magazine that I used to write for called Rookie Magazine, mm -hmm. as well as um, gave a speech about it at Reveal, at the next year's Reveal, and got a standing ovation. And it just really made me cry because uh, I felt like me sharing a story about the body and how it was a place and a site of uh, a lot of stress for me and how I used uh, my ability to uh, form intellectual statements and that kind of thing as a sort of defense mechanism about addressing um, my relationship to that. It's something shared by a lot of people mm. and a lot of young people and getting letters from young women around the world saying, oh my gosh, I have that same condition and now I know I'm not alone. Mm. Or getting letters from older people who've said, wow, even though I'm not a teen girl, I read that piece and I saw myself in it allowed me to be a lot more forceful. And when I finally had this cataract surgery I had to have last year, which was a major moment, um, and being young for having that, right? And having people kind of ask me questions about it. I found that I had a renewed power and sense of dignity when facing the same barriers that I had with doctors who kind of treated me as a lab experiment. From writing that and from hearing from people and from, wow. Yes, because I felt like I had an army of people with me when I finally went yes. in. And it was so interesting how sometimes, you know, they say like the teacher's kind of like waiting for you to come when you come in. I had a person do the worst thing. It was a, a lab tech who came in and said, whoa, this is one of the wildest cataracts I've ever seen. Like, how did this happen to you? And I was thinking, wow, <laughs> thanks to great meditation <laughs> teachers like you, I was like, I'm gonna get curious about this. <laughs> for a moment um, and yes. really thought about it and was able to form like a really well-formed thought of saying, yeah. you know, I demand to see another provider who understands that I'm the CEO of my body and can provide me yes. with the loving care that I, I deserve that. and was able to write letters about, you know, my experience and wanting them to get training and all that kind of thing. And I think it came from being able to share my story and have it resonate with other people that helped me understand the power. So I kind of felt like I had the power of the multitudes so that when I was in that space, I was able to demand it not just for me, but for the next person who's going to go and, and, and be in those doors. And I had a really successful surgery that went extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it could have happened the same way. I think maybe fear would have kept me uh, from addressing it and uh, just sharing the story and having it become less important to repress gave me so much power. And so uh, I just want to share in with anyone who feels like embodiment is a thing that you're struggling with that maybe leaning into the feeling, like you said, mm -hmm. of that discomfort being the thing you should write about or whatever mm -hmm. shame you're carrying, it's the thing you should actually share because it can be quite powerful once you unleash it. Ooh. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I have a lot of identification with what you just shared and uh, in general. I also came to, I was in publishing for a long time and came to this iteration of my work through a big health crisis mm -hmm. and scare. Um, and in my case, I had a false, a major diagnosis that turned out to be a false diagnosis mm -hmm. um, and major surgery that turned out to be unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And it was a bummer. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I'm also very lucky that I didn't, you know, have the, but I had the same, these doctors, sort of this, this, and what I start to think about, when we think about story, another definition of story is diagnosis. Like that's the ultimate mm -hmm. story. Yes. And it's one that we tell a lot of the time and we receive it. And what I happened to me in that moment was I started to have to hold these two parts of my identity and coming back to the question of what does my body tell me about story? My body has really taught me how to slow down and get quiet because my body talks in other languages and I can talk miles around it without really saying much of anything yeah. I learned. So out of, you know, I'm born and raised New Yorker, had media background, all of this stuff happened. And I was like, I know, I know, I'm scared, I'm scared. And I just like did all the stuff very, very quickly as I was told to do. And then I had this result and I sat with it and it was this big conundrum. How does this woman that I am, that's a storyteller and full of all these words, why am I so unable to articulate or stand up for myself or ask questions and wait in the face of an emergency? Right. And what happened is I got really quiet and I proceeded to do 750 hours of yoga teacher training. <laughs> I had to move that much to shake it out. I did a 500 hour and I became really interested in restorative yoga, therapeutic yoga and trauma informed yoga to really learn how do you tease these stories out? Where are they held? What's how, where, where is my body talking? How can I listen to it? And so I got really quiet. And I also discovered um, the program of narrative medicine at Columbia and this whole idea that storytelling and writing is medicine. It's not my special unique experience that I've had a special little like Lisa Weiner, like when I write in my journal, I feel better. It's actually, <laughs> true and there's amazing <laughs> research that I'd love to just talk about for a second this guy James Panbreaker from University of Texas has done these incredible um, research labs called unexpressive writing but it's just proven that if you write for 15 minutes a few times a week you're and this is a really important part that I think we'll come back to what you're talking about you'll you'll feel better literally you'll whatever healing trajectory you're on you're gonna get better faster whether it's cancer depression anxiety insomnia addiction wow. obesity it's very, very, very effective medicine. And I feel so passionate about it because it's teachable, it's free, and we can help each other. And our healthcare system is just not doing that so well. So this stuff really works. And what's really cool about, we've been talking a lot about writing about trauma a lot so far today. And if you write about trauma, there's a lot of proof that it will um, make you feel better. However, there's a lot of proof as well that if you just write about anything, poetry, screenwriting, just that kind of action. And for creative people, this is not a big surprise, but for the medical establishment, it's been a big wow. And this guy, Louis Malmadrona, that I wanna give a shout out to, who also wrote this book called Narrative Medicine, who's such an incredible um, teacher. He breaks it down into four ways, which I think is really my definition of how writing actually heals. So the, there's four stages. And the first stage is that you have to be able to know your story. And that's a big, big roadblock. Most of us have no idea what's going on in here. So that's sort of a little bit we're talking about. We'll do a little embodiment. The second part is telling your story, sharing it, like you just described so beautifully, putting it out there into the world. That, like the, all of it's healing, but we're just getting like more healing as we go down this road. The third step is sharing it with someone who you believe is listening to you. You have that connection. I didn't have that with my doctor, it doesn't sound like you had. It's like, <laughs> but we're having that. And that's like so profound, the healing that goes on when I, I believe that you're listening to me. And then there's this fourth stage, which I think is really the power of this sort of event, is what happens when you share your story to somebody else and that you believe that they are listening to you and that as a group you believe that they believe you're getting better oh, that you're wow. on a healing trajectory that you are you know we're, we're ascending yeah. and that could mean getting better from illness depression da, da, da. it could be getting better at your writing it could be any of that but just the importance of community and the group and it always um, moves me so much because that's so much what's not 
happening. And that is what's happening at, at you know, communions like this right now is that we're getting together. And one of the reasons I wanted to raise hands at the beginning and, and just say who's in the room because it's so great to come in and talk and to listen. But at the end of the day, like you with each other have the power to support your work and bring it into the world and launch and us as community and that kind of engagement is actually where the power lies. Mm. 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 Thank you. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> um, no, we're not done because I, I um, we, we have some activities actually yes. to do and I think that this, um, yeah, I kind of want to talk about this forever, but I feel like, you know, doing, doing, learning by doing yeah. has always been helpful for me. And um, I know that I see some nods. With, so um, can we start with some movement? We can start with some movement. Um, so we're going to start with some movement now. And I, before we, um, I do anything. I want to begin by saying that everything I say is a suggestion, and if you don't want to do anything and you want to stay seated or whatever, that's great. Um, because a lot of us have been sitting down a while and maybe you've been sitting down a lot of the day, I'm going to suggest that we stand up. And if you can't stand or don't want to stand, this can all be done um, seated. You can feel free to spread out into the... Yeah, you can aisle. spread out a little bit. We're going to return to our chairs pretty quickly, so we're not going to go too far from the chairs. I'm going to suggest that you stagger a little bit, so you have a little bit of space. And I'm going to offer basically a short sequence that's designed for writers. And the goal of the sequence is to open up communication channels, get a little bit of warmth and blood moving, and it's also something you can do easily around your desk, wherever that is. So we're going to be using the chairs because I want to teach a little chair yoga. Mm -hmm. This part, you may or may not be bold enough in your offices, but we're going to be bold enough right now. Mm -hmm. So first, just like take a couple breaths and just shake it out a little bit. Get into your body. That's great. Now bring your feet so that they're hips distance apart. And this is one of my favorite moves. It's called the mist clap. And you're literally going to, as if you're going to do a big hand clap, but you're going to miss. So take a couple of, yeah, that's great. So you're going to just breathe like this. And this is a great way to open up the heart center, the neck, the shoulders. And if you want to sway a little bit side to side, do it. And there's just something really good for the nervous system to miss. <laughs> it, it kind of like rewires that kind of playfulness thing this is the kind of thing I do because it's like a little bit silly and I'm not going to do this because I'm wearing a mic but if you want to get more vigorous and <laughs> flip around and kind of hit the side of your um, shoulders there's a great pressure point right behind your shoulders and that's really detoxifying we're gonna look for it. Whoa. Ooh. Opa. <laughs> so be careful of the glass. I'm sure someone's <laughs> gonna come and help us with that. That's great. So take about five more breaths like this. Hitting, moving, mm -hmm. shifting side to side, making sure you're alternating up and down. The glass I think is right over there. <sighs> great. Now let your hands fall and either close your eyes or have a downward gaze. Bring one hand to the lower belly, about three inches below the um, belly button, and one hand to the heart. Letting the shoulders fall away from the ears, the elbows fall down the torso. And sink in, letting the breath fill the palms of your hands. And just take a moment to check in. What does it feel like to be breathing in your body right now? What is your body trying to tell you right now? Does it have a message? Really nice. And slowly release the palms. We'll just stay standing for one more. Bring your palms now in front of your chest and begin to rub them really vigorously. And we're gonna do this just a little bit longer than you want to. 
<laughs> so we get some real heat going. Keep going, keep going even faster. And then bring your palms, when I say so, to any part of your body that just needs a little extra attention right now. For me, it's always my lower back right by my kidneys, so just a little rub, but maybe you have another little spot. I'm not gonna do that though because of the mic. It can go right back to the heart. Yeah, maybe a little self-massage on the neck. We spend so much time giving all of our stuff away. So checking in and receiving your own energy, your own capacity to heal and nurture. And then if there's another spot that's like calling out to you, bring your hands there now. And then make your way back to your seat and take a comfortable seat, finding your feet, your knees, hips distance apart, your feet firmly planted. And we're gonna do a little bit of motion on the chair just to wake up the body a little bit more. Yeah, there's room for this. So on an inhale, on your own, you can bring your hands out to the side, but for today, on an inhale, bringing your arms up alongside your ears, and then hold your arms up, palms facing each other, sink your hips down, breathing here, bringing more space between your hips and your armpits. And then on an exhale, we're gonna mirror, guys. Bring your left hand to your right hip, uh, thigh. So you follow me, Jamia. <laughs> You're a yoga teacher. <laughs> so inhale, lengthen your spine and exhale, twist, pressing down especially into the left foot and left hip. And for today, round the back a little bit to acquire a little bit more softness in the front of the body so you can twist a little bit more. Lower the chin a little bit, keeping the energy inward. And breathe here. Feel that your knees are even, your hips are even. And then relax the shoulders, relax the hands and the arms. Two more breaths like this. And then on your next inhale, bringing both of your arms up alongside your ears. And this time on an exhale, dropping the left hand and lean over towards the left side. Side lean, sink the right hip down, sink both feet down, bring the ears and shoulders away from each other. And again, round the back a little bit just to avoid any arching in the back or hardness in the front of the body. One more breath. And inhaling, coming up. Exhaling, bringing both palms to the front of your thighs and just pausing here, feeling any impact of that movement, sinking the hips, sinking the feet. And we'll take the other side. So on an inhale, lifting both arms up, palms facing each other, shoulders away from ears, and twisting now right hand to the outside of the left thigh. Lowering the shoulders already and lowering the chin and rounding the back. Finding softness in the belly so you can twist. And twisting is so good for digestion. And not just of food, but also ideas, emotions, stories you're holding. And just be in the shape churning from the belly, not from efforting or muscular action, just allowing the breath to swirl around the belly. Keep breathing. You can close your eyes or have a soft gaze. And then inhaling, lifting both of your arms up. 
And right away, exhaling, dropping the right hand and twisting side, lean to the other side. Sink the left hip down, the left foot down. Inhaling. And exhaling. And then inhaling, coming back up to sit. And lastly, with eyes closed, if that's, that's uncomfortable to you, bring your, your index finger and your middle finger to the side of your eyes and begin to massage your temples. And you can lower the chin to stretch out the back of the neck. And let it be a firm but not digging action, like you're playing in the sand. And then allowing the fingers to move up the hairline. See if you can release any thoughts, any old narrative that's come up, like a movie that's winding down. And then bringing your index finger and middle finger to your jaw, the hinge of your jaw. Opening and closing the mouth. Finding any gnarly old anything in there. Down to the chin. And then taking the last few breaths to either give a little self-massage to the back of the neck or the cheeks or the nose, anywhere that's calling to you. And then arrive back in a seat, bringing the hands to the tops of your thighs. Noticing any changes, anything that stayed the same. And then you can flutter your eyes and come back to the room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to pop back in here real quick, just because we're going to have a glass cleaning moment. <laughs> because it is kind of like a, you know, we had a thought party earlier, now it's a real party. Um, yeah, my colleague is going to help us out here. And, um, and we'll sweep up most of the series. Everybody, i just been checking in, no sandals or anything like that. Like, we'll, we'll get the majority of it, and then we can She's continue. Good. Yeah? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So that was beautiful. And I hope everybody is feeling as refreshed as I am right now and tranquil. Uh, it was just really lovely. We can, we can pause. You know, you, you know, just... Maybe this is also a good moment for me to just check in about another practical matter, which is, yeah. would you like a writing board? So if you would, just raise your hand. OK, looks like a, quite a few. So we'll bring them, them around, and we'll make sure that you guys get those. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, back to you. Thank you. So again, thank you so much. What we're going to do now is we've done this beautiful embodied practice, and we've done it together, which I always think kind of raises the energy in a room, just yeah. fertile ground for creativity. And now we're going to do some writing prompts that are going to help us kind of move the writing that's coming out. You know, we were like releasing some of those stories. I know I felt some when we were doing the twists. Mm. So now we have an opportunity to do that. So the first one, I want us to imagine in the sanctuary that we're in right now, the writing sanctuary that makes us feel like we're most free in our writing as we start this prompt. So, and, feel as if we're working. Hmm? The writing sanctuary that where we feel as if, if we're most free to write. Because I recognize we're in sanctuary right now. I feel that in this museum whenever I come here. But I also know that for myself, some of the best advice I've gotten as a writer is to create writing sanctuary for myself, a spot in my home that is always the place where I feel safe, free, and myself to write. And so that is gonna be something different for each of us. And that could even be a place in nature or it could be several places, but I want us to envisage that when we are starting this prompt. And the question that I want us to 
write about is to think about the story that's going on in your body. And let's write for the next few minutes about the story in your body right now in the present and release that onto the page. About our final thought for that portion of the exercise, you can come back to it later, but we're on our last minute. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you for doing that and thanking your bodies and also thanking you for those stories that you just released out into the world. And now we're going to do another invitation for a prompt, which is to write about the story that you haven't written yet for fear of what the most intimidating critic in your life might think about you. That critic could be, if you're a writer of books, your editor or your agent. It could be your mom, your dad, your dog. Well, we said maybe cats more like, than your dog <laughs> <laughs> earlier. But who is the critic that you think about when you might doubt writing about something or who might intimidate you if you thought about them reading about this truth that you would create into a story and then write about that story that you would write if you could release the fear of what they think. And we'll do that for the next couple of minutes. You don't have to write the story right now, but what that story would be and a little bit of how it might feel to write that story.
about to wrap up that truth right now, but you can always come back to it. And we'll just take about 30 more seconds for you to finish that thought. Thank you. Okay, so I know that um, you may not be finished writing what you're writing, but um, what I love about these prompts is, yeah, the ability to come back and somehow getting it started in a group of people can really um, be helpful, you know, to, to go home and know there's, there's a bit of something there to start to work on. Um, Right now we want to invite you to do some um, sharing really in the spirit of the listening that um, I think Lisa spoke of so beautifully earlier. Um, and you can share one of three things, uh, or these are the suggestions. It could be the first piece that you wrote, first writing prompt, could be second writing prompt, could be just to talk about your experience of writing those things, what you're feeling in your body, what you, you know, how it was for you to, to actually write that out, difficulty, joy, whatever it was. Um, and want to ask you to get into pairs to do this. And um, so, yeah, if you could like turn to somebody, maybe not somebody, maybe not the same person you were with before, but someone new if you can. Um, just turn your body so that you can kind of you can get a sense that you're together with someone. And if there's anyone who doesn't have a pair yet, raise your hand. Yeah. Make eyes connect. Tell them no feedback. Okay. Before you start, you'll have more, a little more, um, a little more instruction. So don't, don't, don't start yet. Don't start yet. Just wanted to pair you up. Okay. So don't start yet. But is there anyone who needs help finding a partner? There's someone back in the back corner here and, and right over here. Do y'all see each other? Okay. Nope. <laughs> Um, that, will anyone willing to trade with break up the, the flow here? <laughs> Doesn't. Okay, they're coming over. You're getting. You're getting <laughs> okay, great. Thank you for that. All right. Um, so, I wanted to. Um, the thing that's going to be um, helpful here is the opposite of art school, where you're not going to get feedback. <laughs> so, um, the, the invitation is actually to just. Um, you know, while you're sharing to um, share from the heart and while you're listening to, um, you know, hold space for the other person. And I, I love the, um, I love, I think it was the fourth, what, what the fourth element that makes narrative healing, um, the sense that we're actually listening to this person in their wholeness, in their wellness, in their capacity, that we're, as listeners, have an unwavering attention on the goodness of this other human being. And that's our only job. You know, we don't have to, have to respond in any particular way. We don't have to tell them what we like or what we don't like. It's just that, that listening can be healing as well. Um, anything to add about that? No? Okay. So, um, so yeah, just decide who will go first. Um, go ahead and, and share. Other person listens. Take a pause in between. Take a breath or two. And then switch. And then when you're done sharing, um, you can just kind of turn your bodies forward again somewhat so that we can get a sense that people are mostly done. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I love that. So no
So taking the last minute or so, making sure both people have shared. So coming back once both people have shared their, their pieces. to guide before the end of our, our um, evening together and uh, in parts of desire to um, have you cultivate something that you can really take, take from here and use. So, um, Lisa. Yeah, so in our last few minutes, and we're going to be around for questions upstairs, um, hopefully we can cultivate some friendship, um, turn to your desk and find a piece of paper and an envelope. We're going to invite you to self-address the envelope and draft a letter to your future self. <laughs> and we just have a couple minutes to do this, so this is going to be a quick little love note. And you may have a lot to say, but just any, any tools or tips or anything you heard in the last um, period of time that might be supportive or nurturing to your future self when you're sitting down to write or hold your story or someone else's story, what do you need to know? What do you think you might forget? What can you remind them? Give them permission for. And we're going to give you a couple minutes to write this and then um, you'll place it in the envelope and we're going to collect this and send it to you, Adam. You're writing a letter to your future self with tips, anything you've learned tonight that might be supportive in your writing practice or storytelling practice in the future. Something you heard, something you saw, something you experienced. We're going to come around with a little more paper too. We're keeping you busy. Mm -hmm. Mustard and all the time. That's my message to myself. Wear mustard. It can be practical. It can be like a love letter of encouragement, reminder to be accountable. It could be very practical about what you want to be, have in your practice. You have just a couple minutes.
So you're going to have about another minute. Lisa mentioned um, we'll be hanging out for a while um, up in the cafe for a few minutes if you have any questions or you want to talk about your practice or find more out more about um, our practices we're happy to share with you um, in a more intimate way we didn't end up doing a big Q&A today um, but we really hope this was useful for you it was so um, I don't know for me life affirming to be here with you all um, and forgot to mention uh, and say hello actually uh, to the folks that are joining us via live stream. You know, there's a whole bunch of reasons why people can't get down to the Rubin Museum. They're caring for kids, they're caring for loved ones, their you know, bodies aren't up to it today. Um, and so we just really want to say hi and thank you for joining us and um, uh, keep writing. And um, I'd love to close with just a moment of pause, too. I know that some of you might still be writing or like seven envelopes, but if we could just um, uh, pause together for a moment. And one of the things that I often like to do at the end of programs like these is to just reflect on kind of our, our highest collective intention. And um, in the meditation world that I come from, it said that when we, you know, a bunch of people come together to work with their hearts and their minds and their lives, um, it not only benefits us, but it actually um, tunes us to be of service in a deeper way to each other and to the people that we're connected to and to the world at large in ways that we know and in ways that we can't possibly know. And that we can um, uh, amplify that benefit with our intention. And so that's what we'll do now. If you want to close your eyes or just soften them to the space in front of you and um, notice how your body is now. And reflecting on any moments that um, brought energy and um, enthusiasm and motivation to your mind or your heart this evening. Moment of connection, inspiration, a tool that you can use. And imagine that each, in each one of us that um, that feeling becomes a light in our heart that starts to blend with the lights around us to become a field. That we collectively become like an acupuncture point mm. that can heal the space around us. And just to connect, if you like, with the wish that our actions today, our contemplations, our, our writing exercises, our practices um, be of benefit to all beings in all directions. May this be a healing practice for all. Thank you so much for joining me in that. Thank you so much. This is brilliant.